and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Um, ask everyone to turn off their cell phones, including myself, and uh, ask everybody to stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. With that, uh, I'll ask for the call of the roll. Gladly. President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary Kaminsky. I'm here. Treasurer Brandstand. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Member McFarland. Here. Member Singer. Here. We're all here. Wow, all here. present attendance. That's great. Uh, moving into the consent agenda. Um, for those that have the agenda in front of you, you can see what's in there. Uh, some approval of some textbooks, the approval of the last meeting minutes, um, a staff member announced resignation, a projection of our insurance and property values, and payment of school's bills for the month of October. Any additions or deletions requested for the consent agenda or questions thereof? See none, I'll accept a uh, motion. I move that we accept consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.5. Support. Moved, moved by Treasurer Branch, support by Secretary Kaminsky. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> the ayes have it. That will move into re uh, address, request to address the board. We have no formal requests this evening. Does anyone else here care to wish to address the board? See none. Going, going, gone. We'll then move on to Board of Education matters, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sherrill. We have our Shining Star presentations first. And um, our first employee we want to recognize today, all day Cindy tried to teach me how to pronounce this, so if I say it wrong, I'm sorry. Kim Outenin? <laughs> that doesn't normally happen, Kim, so come on up. Kim, Kim began her career with Midland Public Schools in the August of 2000 as a member of the Social Studies Department at H.H. Dow High School. Ms. Outenin earned her bachelor's degree from Northern Michigan University in May 2000 with a major in Social Studies, a minor in English, and while teaching full-time, Kim completed her master's degree in Humanities from Central Michigan University in December of 2002. Kim also taught Global Studies, U.S. History, World History, American Studies, Humanities across all four grade levels during her 13 plus years at Midland Public Schools. Kim is a positive, creative professional in her approach with students and colleagues at Dow High School. Students are interested and engaged in her classroom. She makes every minute count. Kim was nominated for the Shining Star Award by a parent of a Dow High senior and varsity football player. This parent wrote, the parents of the varsity football team wanted to paint banners for their players during Spirit Week. Ms. Outenin arranged for the parents to have access to the art closet one evening. Not every parent was able to attend and paint a banner for their son. Ms. Outenin offered to have students in her student leadership class paint the remaining banners so every player had a sign hanging in the stadium that Friday night. She did not want anyone to be without a sign. She continually offered more help and asked what she could do to help the parents make their players feel special. She was quite kind and professional. She extended herself on to the parents and extended her time beyond the classroom. She certainly shined on behalf of the Dow High School. Congratulations, Kim. <laughs> Thanks for what you do. Thank you. Yeah. Your son was beaming. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. And our second employee <laughs> that we're honoring tonight is Rob Lewis. And let me read a little bit about Rob. Rob began his employment with Midland Public Schools in March of 2012 as a systems analyst in the technology department. Rob holds a bachelor's degree from Northwood University in Management Information Systems and two associate's degree from Delta College in Networking Technologies and PC Systems and Support. For more than three years before coming to Midland Public Schools, Rob was a systems engineer with the Claire Gladwin RESD. Rob has an outstanding work ethic and provides excellent customer service to both students and staff. In the short time he has been part of Midland Public Schools technology team, Rob has done an excellent job keeping up with the ever-evolving world of technology. In addition to his normal server support role, Rob has done a wonderful job of juggling multiple large technology projects for the district. 
Rob plays an instrumental role in the iPad project that was launched in elementary buildings last year. I don't know if this next part is a good or a bad part, but this is what they had to write about yet. <laughs> <laughs> it must, it's a, gets to the technology kind of nerd thing here. So Rob was nam nominated for the Shining Star Award by the MPS colleague. Among her comments, the staff member wrote, Rob is very friendly and very helpful when anyone stops by and asks for help. Rob goes out of his way to make th the experience a positive one. He is a very smart tech guy, but also has the social skills to be approachable. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part. Uh, that's the both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I can always go to Rob and ask a question without feeling like I'll be judged for my lack of tech skills. Rob brings life to the room and is a positive asset to his department. Congratulations, Rob. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. We have uh, two presentations tonight, and the first one is going to be from East Lawn, and I'll let Bonnie introduce whoever she brought with her tonight. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. I'm Bonnie Westerbelt, principal of East Lawn, and our Eagles are here tonight <clears throat> to share with you. Um, we made some decisions, tried to take a look at which, which initiatives from East Lawn we wanted to bring forth to you tonight. We decided we wanted you to help us celebrate our youngest authors from East Lawn. So tonight we're going to be talking about our authors from kindergarten and first grade. And we have with us tonight Mrs. Ray Fisher, Amy Ray Fisher, Patricia Clancy, and Nikki Coleman. Amy? Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to come out and, and talk to you a little bit and, and celebrate our youngest writers, our, our kindergarten and first grade authors. And I think whenever we can, um, stand and, and talk about children and, and what they do and, and, and um, how we work with them. That's always a great thing, so thank you. Um, my name is Amy Rye Fisher. I teach at East Lawn. This is my 26th year there. I've spent my entire career at East Lawn teaching kindergarten, first grade, Title I, and reading recovery. And so um, for those of us who kind of devote our career to the youngest grades, we know that um, just the basic nature of those grades, we're spending um, a lot of our time and devoting a lot of our teaching to helping children become literate. And that means helping them to learn to read, to write, to become stronger speakers, and to become more responsive listeners. And um, when you teach a child to read, you are teaching her to bring someone else's thoughts and feelings and um, meaning up off the printed page. But when you teach a child to write, um, the child learns to record her own thoughts and feelings um, and meaning and ideas. And she can represent all of that then on her own. And um, so that's what we want to talk to you a little bit tonight. We want to talk about our writers, our, our youngest writers. I was fortunate, and I'm still very fortunate in Midland Public Schools, um, from my very earliest student teaching experiences in um, the late 80s at Adams Elementary School to um, experience the power and um, the, uh, the writing workshop model. We had lots and lots of professional development, lots of training, lots of book studies. I was fortunate to be surrounded by colleagues who were um, very, very devoted to teaching children to write. Um, I was fortunate to walk alongside Hillary Ferguson and Judy Zak and be surrounded by folks who had this shared vision for what children could do as writers even in the youngest grades. So um, I consider all those things a huge benefit and a part of my career. But the most important fact I learned from those very earliest experiences, even student teaching, was that um, young children can write. They need to write. And they have so much to say. Um, so how do we do this in kindergarten at East Lawn School? How do we empower our four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and six-year-olds in kindergarten um, all coming to us at very, very different levels. That's kind of the nature of kindergarten, especially in the fall. How do we empower them to become writers? So I want to share a few thoughts on that, and then I have lots of writing I'd like to share with you um, tonight, too. So number one, we capitalize um, in kindergarten on the partnered or reciprocal nature of teaching children to read and write. Reading and writing go hand in hand, along with listening and speaking. So one of the things that we do is we immerse our youngest writers and readers in rich literature as much as possible. We expose them to uh, meaningful language, um, 
rich illustrations and we use published authors as role models. And so um, there may be a time that I'm sharing a book by Eric Carle and, and maybe we read it the first couple of times just for fun. But then maybe I go back to, to this text and um, we talk about it from with more of writer's ears and writer's eyes. And I may read this page. Suddenly a storm turns the water into big waves. A strong wind whistles across the sea, whistles across the sea. And there's so much to be learned just from that teeny little bit of text um, that, that we can use to help children um, uh, build language and build thoughts and build, build ideas and build illustration for them to them take eventually, or maybe soon, into their own writing. Maybe I share the book um, in November by Cynthia Ryland, which is a very beautiful piece of prose with um, just stunning illustrations. And so when I read the page in November, the trees are standing all sticks and bones. Without their leaves, how lovely they are, spreading their arms like dancers. They know it is time to be still. And so we can take things that we talk about on a daily basis, the fact that the leaves in Midland are, have fallen and the trees are bare, and we can put Cynthia Ryland's words to it and use those as um, models for children's own writing. I'll share one more page because this happens to be my favorite book. Um, in November at Winter's Gate, the stars are brittle. The sun is a sometimes friend, and the world has tucked her children in with a kiss on their heads till spring. And then there will be times when you hear echoes from texts you read, not just in the children's writings, but um, for example, when we do the weather graph in the morning, and of course this morning was exceptionally overcast, and, and one of the children mutters, the sun is a sometimes friend. <laughs> um, you know that you're helping to build up a different way of thinking, a different way of expressing that will eventually, or sooner, work, work its way into the children's writing. So we use um, lots of rich literature uh, on a very important mindset that we use and um, concentrate on and, and really live with at Islan is we build on children's strengths. And we view these youngest students, four, five, and six-year-olds as writers. And we absolutely believe that all children are already ready to, to write, to read and to write. And, um, and all, the, all the people and all the adults who come in contact with our children, we have to believe that. That's what we believe. And then um, also kind of from an instructional standpoint, when we're empowering and working to um, help our children become writers and better writers at Islan. We use the writing workshop model or instructional <coughs> strategy to provide a daily or almost daily predictable structured writing environment um, where adults are working alongside or conferencing with children, um, having conversations, very real conversations about what the children are writing about, helping to get print on the page, um, seeing the children and knowing they're really writing and really authors. and. Um, Kids are writing on top, topics of their choice because the best, your, your, the best writing comes from what you know. Um, and the, the other beautiful thing about writing workshop is the needs of every child in your classroom are met through that model. All the children are writing at the same time. They're all at different levels. Um, and so it, it, regardless of academic level or life experience, everyone can write. Everyone's writing during writing workshop. Um, it's a time of, again, uh, lots of positive interaction between adult and child, and um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this model has extra power in my classroom this year because um, Mrs. Karen Fenske, our Title I instructional support professional, and I work um, very carefully together to help empower those little ones in our classroom. So that has been an, a very added um, advantage, and it's been nothing but a positive experience. So, um, writing workshops. So, what do the kindergartners, um, since they have this choice and um, the topic choice is theirs during writing workshop, what are, the, what are they writing about? They're four, they're five years old, they're, they might be six. So I have a few things I'd love to share with you. Some pieces and um, a, a large amount of meaning in early writing comes through illustration. Children represent meaning through pictures. And so this happens to be on September 5th, and this was a little one um, named Abby. And um, we kind of had a shared um, write on 
um, memory from the summer. And Abby wasn't yet ready for text at that point, but she sure was ready for meaning. Um, you can see she um, was representing the meaning from and uh, telling the story from being at the spray park over the summer. If you can kind of key in, if you've ever been to one, um, you know they're usually in a bit of a circle like this, and she has the bucket stumping down. She has the trees and the beautiful sun. It's a nice summer day. Lots of voice carried in her pictures. Um, this is another little one, just a teeny bit later in September. And she wrote about the same thing. It's kind of popular around here. We have lots to choose from, right? Spray parks. And she was ready for a bit of text with adult support, a guide by the side. And she wrote, I love to go to the um, spray park. And you see how she chose to represent that in picture just a teeny bit differently, right? The other one was a bit of a bird's eye view. Now, this is Gracie. And Gracie wrote, the print is a little bit hard to tell. The pencil was a bit light on September 12th. Um, I love to catch frogs. And I put this one in because when I conferenced with Gracie's mom, she looked at that and she said, that's at Holton Lake. <laughs> and and she, that's all mom needed to see was the picture of Gracie with the frog in the water. And um, that's a powerful thing, too, because parents are uh, on board immediately. And they, uh, we have lots of good laughs and sometimes a little bit of tears at parent-teacher conferences and at our writer's PMA when we're looking at children's writing. Um, this is another one we put in October. I tried to put a few in from each month. And we came back from La Cronia, and we had a shared experience of, of being there, obviously. And Adriana wrote, we went on a hayride to pick a pumpkin. And if you've ever been to La Cronia, especially this year, oops, you need to, um, oh, sorry, um, to get out to the pumpkin patch out by the highway, you pass by a, um, a pet pig, a big pet. Oh, yes. Pink pig in a behind a gate, and so she has all that meaning. It was a windy day, hair was blowing, uh, everybody was happy, even Mr. Lacronier driving the tractor was happy. And Adriana worked all that meaning, and she came back from that trip and, and was able to represent all of that um, as, a, as a young author. One more from the trip I wanted to share because this was Gracie's, and she didn't finish the print, and that's okay. She finished the meaning through the illustration, and, and again, if you've ever been there, and I bet some of you have. You sit on bales of hay and you get to um, hold different animals. And this is Gracie holding the baby goat. Look at its little legs there. And then the other thing, when you're, she represented two big things. When you're looking at the pens of animals, this is exactly what it was like. There were two um, pigs, and in the middle there were some goats, and there were some miniature horses over here. And she came back from that trip and had all those images and thoughts and meaning in her mind and was able to represent that as, an, as a young writer. A couple more. Um, personal narratives are, are the bulk of what we write during writing workshop, and those are pieces of writing. You write about things that have happened to you. So there's a lot of we went. This is Connor's. We went to the water park where I took my swim class. And um, he even got the dolphin up on the ceiling of the community center. There are those ocean animals painted. He worked that in as quite a detail. Um, Max's piece, I went to the corn maze at the farm. I had fun. Now we're getting into some. Um, uh, one or two sentences. Uh, this is, I guess, how I want to I want to close with a couple <coughs> final thoughts. That one of the most powerful things that young writers do is they're learning all these skills really quickly, um, lots of different kinds of skills. And it, it used to be before they were um, representing those things in print, you, they would just tell you about them, or you'd go on the playground and they'd want to show you them. And now they can write about them. This is Kiana who said, "I like to jump rope outside." Oh, this took place at her home. I like to jump rope outside. My mom watches me and my brother. And there they are, you know, watching Kiana with this newfound skill of jumping rope. And um, this is one more. I have a new skill, and I'm going write, to write about it. Um, this is Taylor's piece. I was playing at my house. I can do the monkey bars now. Oh. And if you look, if you these, I think, are fun. You know, if we had another hour, two, three, four hours, we could do much more. But, um, there's lots to see in these pictures when little ones put their meaning in print. And I wanted to close with Alex's. I mentioned before that writing workshop enables children of all levels to, um, to be writers and to represent meaning. And this was, can anybody see the date? November, November 15th. So we're using some prior knowledge here. And um, this little guy here is his grandpa. And he used a, a meaningful color. It was more of a peach or skin tone. So it's hard to see his grandpa there. But see what he's doing? Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> He's shooting yeah, in your ear. <laughs> and so there's um, Alex's piece on the first day, I believe, of, of deer hunting. Oh, <laughs> November 15th. And he's writing about his papa um, going deer hunting. Is he ready for text yet? No, not yet. He will be ready for text soon. And, and if I asked him tomorrow, Alex, are you a writer? He would tell me, yes, I can write. I'm a writer. Um, lots of personal narratives and writing workshop. Um, I'm going to close it off and and introduced Trisha Clancy with two poems. And these were written by my children last April. Um, we do a lot of talking about poems and poetic language. And Jacob wrote a poem called Butterfly. Butterflies are pretty. Yes, they are. They are like artists in heaven. And then Isaiah wrote, because when you're five, this is what's important. And he wrote a poem about preschool. Preschool was fun, very fun. And Silas played with me. And Silas played forever and ever. <laughs> and so that's Isaiah's poem about preschool. So thanks so much for just a few minutes of, of the time at the meeting tonight to give you a little taste or a little flavor of kindergarten writers at East Lawn School. Thank you. And Trish is going to come up now. Well, in first grade at East Lawn, we are fortunate that we have this amazing foundation. Our children come in believing they're writers and they can write. And we continue that process. Um, but there was a time when um, there was a lot of thinking that in the early grades, children learned to read and write. And then when they got older, they wrote to learn. We don't wait for that to happen anymore. Children are both learning to read and write, and they're using the process of reading and writing to learn about the world around them. And um, we've, we've come to realize that when I went to school, there was the idea that you had to go to school to get a lot of information. The teacher had the information. The books at school had the information. Maybe if you were lucky, you had a set of encyclopedias at home. But information was kind of hard to come by. But now in our world today, information is everywhere. Our kids can go to the telephone and get information, right? Their, their, their parents' smartphones. So we feel we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to help kids be very um, smart consumers and producers of information. And we have found over the last couple of years, the most motivating and engaging way to do that, to help kids um, become effective readers and writers and viewers and speakers and listeners of information is through inquiry projects. And we've been very excited about them. And um, so we're going to share with you um, some of the things we've been doing with informational reading and writing through inquiry. Um, Nikki's gonna first tell you about um, a project we did this fall with our first graders and some of our kindergartners, and then I'll come back up and talk about some things that, um, that we do as the, as the year goes on. So, Nikki? Hello, and I actually have this book. I'll just pass it along, and I can pick it up tomorrow or another day so you can take a look at it. I included some of the writing in the, in the actual slideshow presentation so that people can see that. Um, so like Trisha said, we recently did a lower out inquiry based project about bats. And as a culmination project, we created the informational book. Students worked as paired writers for each page. And throughout the informational book, in creating it, they also learned the different text features, which is a new common core standard that they learned text features such as a table of context, or the glossary at the back of the book. So it was a very meaningful project for them, not only of a high, um, high interest to learn all about these bats close to the Halloween holidays, but also to be able to see where your writing fit within a table of contents and where your writing uh, fit within a glossary of vocabulary that you have. So, the writing samples that we have, um, the idea that bats eat insects and that bats eat beetles, bats catch bugs with their wings. And this was after a lot of preparation using KWL, the knowledge that we gained through our study, what we wanted to learn from a guest speaker that we had, and then in the end, what we know and what we can write about. I love that as well, talking about with what Amy said, the illustrations really tell it all. This is that bats are nocturnal, and keep this, these students knew 
that they wouldn't be able to say echolocation because that comes on another page for another student, but they still could put it in their picture that they're <laughs> using it at night. So nocturnal means that bats sleep in the day and then they eat bugs at night. They see better than people. And then here is our echolocation. Bats use echolocation. Bats use this so they can find their other bats, their own bats in their colony. The bats pop, pop, pop. This is echolocation bouncing off of trees and bugs. And the pop, pop, pop came from our guest speaker that we were able to do with funding um, in our building. And they have an amplifier so they could actually show us and they have recorded what bats sound like. So it was very meaningful for the students. Along with using anchor text, rich literature, and guest speakers, we also really appreciate the iPads. And I have something to show you, an app that we use from Bookarella, if you would like to see that. to learners that they have another hook and another depth to really learn. So this was kind of a culminating app that we used. And if I could just take you through just a quick second of chapter one. between the language and the, the voice of the, uh, the narrator. It makes you feel like he could just reach right out and, <laughs> and touch that. So it, they, we just appreciate that so much. And it has such a huge influence <coughs> in what the students produce. So we wanted to share that with you. just as we switch our technology a little bit. Um, so the idea with the inquiry is that we capitalize on the natural curiosity of children about the world. They have so many questions. They wonder about everything. And with all the information at their disposal, why not let them explore those topics? And so we find things that um, are interesting to them and ask them to ask their own questions. So each one of our first graders had their own individual uh, question about bats that they use iPad apps, um, traditional texts read to them, books that they could read on their own to find their answers to their questions. And then were information producers and created either a big book or my children produced posters that they hung around the school to answer those questions and to share that information with others. And as the year goes on, um, we continue to let them explore and have uh, opportunities to learn about their own interests. And that way, the teachers freed up. Um, we don't have to um, worry about motivating or engaging kids. They're already motivated and engaged. And we can push into their work, finding the answers to their questions, and teach all the standards that we need to teach about reading informational text, um, writing informational text. And we find that when we empower the kids to explore their <coughs> own ideas and to be in charge of their own learning, we actually can exceed our, they, they always exceed our expectations. They do amazing things. Um, so I just want to show you real quickly um, Jaden's I Wonder book that she's creating on her iPad using an app called iDiary. And um, this was a, um, this was a, this app is like a journal. It's written like a diary. 
and um, each day the kids have time to write in it, and they can also write in it anytime they want. And it's a place to record their questions about the world. And this was just an entry on October 31st from Jaden. I wonder why the flowers are dead in the winter and in the spring they are alive. Another question that she had. I wonder why in the fall the day is short and in the summer it is long. Just her natural curiosity, the one she, the one she wrote um, just the other day, this, um, and they take these home, and so she wrote this, actually wrote this one on the weekend, um, I think, or maybe it was in school, but she's always writing in it. This one, I want to know all about Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Look at the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Who would ever think that a six-year-old wants to know everything there is to know about Mount, Ru Mount Rushmore? It's not in the first grade curriculum, but yet it is. She's going to learn about Mount Rushmore mm -hmm. if she chooses to this year. And we will be right there beside her to help her to do that. And we can, we can teach everything we need to teach when she's in charge of her learning. Um, so as, she's a as the kids ask questions throughout the year, in the, end, in the spring, they're able to um, pick a topic for their, for their big inquiry project. And I just want to share some of the amazing things that um, my students did uh, last spring. Um, the, these books that they produced, again, they had their own um, topic choice. They um, thought of their own questions they wanted to investigate. And um, it was just amazing the topics the kids chose. Irish dance, skydiving, just in a, a, carriages, just a, a wide range of things. But Katrina has a rabbit at home, and so she chose to study rabbits. I just wanted to share a little bit of this text. Because just like um, Amy talked about, we use authors as mentors. And um, she wrote this in the first person as if she were the rabbit. I am a rabbit. I live in the ground. I was born without an egg. We're doing the egg to chick unit, so that was important to her. <laughs> I grew inside my mother. When I was first born, I had no fur or down. I drank milk from my mother. I eat plants. Sometimes I eat carrots from a garden. I hop into the garden. My long back legs help me hop. You can buy a bunny from a pet store. You better watch out because some are mean, some are nice. <laughs> I am not a pet bunny. I am a wild bunny. I have to be careful because eagles, foxes, and weasels like to eat me. I hop really fast into my burrow to be safe. And you can see she's labeled her picture. Eagle, me, my burrow. <laughs> I am a rabbit. So just amazing. And um, if you look, I'm not, um, I'm not telling the kids how to present this information. And so that comes through when you see the, the diversity. Um, this little girl that I wanted to show you, snails, um, we had a science volunteer that came in and had given uh, each one of the kids a seashell from Florida. And we had done some inquiry because we were very curious about these shells, and she took it a step further. She wanted to know more because that had kind of, she actually had no idea that shells were from living things before this. And she was just fascinated by it. And this was her book um, about snails, um, Snails by Megan. She's got her table of contents to mom and dad. <laughs> snails in winter, it is winter. This snail is hibernating all winter. Snails go in their shells to keep warm. They use mucus to keep the cold out, and here you have them all sealed up. <laughs> it is spring. The snail stops hibernating. It goes in the shade. If snails are out in the sun, they dry out and die. And you can see on the picture, she learned that snails' eyes are on the ends of their antennas. So she went to show that this snail was dead, and look where the X's are on him. <laughs> oh, amazing. It is summer. The snail is going to look for food. It slides on a green leaf. When it slides on the leaf, it eats the leaf with its tongue. It is fall. The food is hard to find in the falling leaves. Soon the snail will hibernate. And then she's made it a circle story to come back around to the, to the fall. So you can hear her voice. You can see what she has learned. She had ownership. She was empowered to tell what she wanted to tell. And um, just one of the very many, many amazing um, writers and readers that we have at East Lawn. And, we just wanted to thank you for letting us come and, and share what they can do. 
Um, they're always amazing us, and we would like them to amaze you as well. So you are always welcome to come and visit um, our classrooms and see our writers in action. Um, we'd love to have you. Okay. Out there, is there any, um, from any three of us, any questions that you might have or? I'll think of a Chris, couple. Go ahead. I'll think of a couple. I've got a couple, but I'm, yeah. I defer, so. <clears throat> no? I don't have a question right now. I, I just think it's amazing. I, I just, between the kindergarten at mm -hmm. the beginning of the year and what you just yeah. showed, yes. just how far the kids the come. Mm -hmm. I have a son in kindergarten right now, so this is really hits home for me, and I, and I just wanted to say that it's great to see our kids uh, in such wonderfully gifted and caring hands, so thank you for that. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, my one question is, what was the name of that app that you just displayed where the kids create the different books? Book creator. Book creator. It is an excellent. Okay. Very um, user friendly, child friendly. But is it adult friendly? <laughs> 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 you, can, you can print. I wanted um, they can have one, and you can print them as well. Oh, okay. So from there, so here she has this one that I asked to have back for tonight. Um, that, and then of course you know she had to do more once it was printed. There's even there's even more in this. Wow. This version, oh. but it's nice that you can create. Um, it can be an ebook that you can email to others. Um, you can email it as a PDF, or you can print it. That's a great use of technology. Well done, really. Thank you. I, I noticed with the use of technology, uh, my question was, is the following, and then I've you've partially answered by your demonstration. Um, writing at this young age, especially the few years you're dealing with, and the discrepancies on fine motor skills can be huge and really demotivating to a kid if they don't have the fine motor skills. Do you, I've noticed a lot of these are obviously typed, if you want to call it that, keyboard. Um, talk to me a little bit about the fine motor skills and the abilities and that hampering kids versus the technology enabling them to not let that hamper them. Any comment? Um, my, we have the iPads just in first grade. They don't have them in kindergarten. Obviously, we wouldn't, um, use the technology in place of. So we're right. always working on building the fine motor skills. Children do learn to print and, and they print beautifully. Um, but yeah, some, for some children, um, my children always have the choice to use their iPad at writing workshop time if they choose. Um, and so some children do tend to want to um, use the iPad to write their stories instead of, um, instead of writing it. And of course, we always make sure that there's a balance. You know, you've done a couple here, let's try this. But one of the advantages, too, is on Book Creator, you can easily um, load in pictures. So I had a little boy last year took all kinds of pictures of his dog and then downloaded them into the Book Creator and then created the story with the illustrations and then typed it. Um, so like the journal that I showed you, the first one, that was not adult edited. Of course, the, the, the final products, the published ones, the snail one and the horse one, those were adult edited. But they did do the actual. Um, typing themselves, and then I went back through and, and fixed it up. But yes, it does motivate some. For others, not as much, but yeah, it can, it can be a window into that. Um, and for some, they feel they can write more when they can type, and others feel they, it slows them down, so it just hmm. depends on the child. So it is a function of the motor skills, probably. Yes, it is. <laughs> is yeah. if, they, if they're fine, it doesn't yep. get in their way. So it, doesn't actually so it allows them not to be impeded by that exactly. to be able to write. Thank you. Do, do the ones that struggle with typing, do they use the voice function at all? I don't have a lot of experience with that. So they do, they have, um, you know, you can record your voice and mm -hmm. then go back and type it. Um, I haven't done a lot with that, but they, the potential is definitely there. Okay. Yeah, I haven't done a lot with that. We're so, we're so intent on getting them to, you know, that reciprocity between reading and writing and working on those sounds that, we, uh, we tend to not look for that opportunity, but it's something to think about. I just a comment. I find it fascinating to see what <coughs> that you all presented, that these little ones are excited. They're, they're ready to write. You know, when I think back just 10, 20 years ago when my some of my kids were younger, it really wasn't a, you did it, but it, you didn't get that positive comment like you just said they're ready and it's funny because my son has five-year-old twin boys and he just said the other day they are loving writing oh. and so this is just very timely that was just a surprise to me because the fine motors aren't that great yet but yet they have that enthusiasm and that passion and to let them go 
I'm assuming that is what you're seeing. Exactly. When, you, when you stifle them, then they... Exactly. So. Don't let them think that that's anything, too, because it's about meaning. You know, when we read books, we read for meaning. When we write, it's about getting my message out. And children have stories to tell. So, yes, they're very motivated. And then we can show them, either through technology or through just paper and pencil, you have a way, you have a voice, and you can, mm. we can empower you to get that out and share it with the world. So it's, it's very joyful to teach in this way. Um, very joyful for, for everyone in the room. Writing workshop is a joyful place for any Sloan. So. Well, your examples were very fun and definitely joyful, so good luck. One thing I had too, Amy, is when you, when you talked about the young author who had, had the, the great um, pictures <laughs> and very few letters on the page, uh -huh. I thought it was neat how he knows he's an author. He knows he can write. Yeah. And uh, even though they're not there yet, they have that in their mind and, and obviously are being told mm. and, and tutored that you are a writer. And I think that's, that's great for those who aren't, aren't quite there as well. Right. Uh, and, uh, um, you, you have two ways of looking at children. You can look at their strengths, or you can look at, at, at their weaknesses. You know, So you can look at all the things the child can do and move from there, or you can look at what he has yet to know and what he has yet to be able to do and try to move from there. And I'll tell you which one works better and which one feels better to you, the child, and everybody around you. And so we really, really work from strengths. Um, and back to what Jerry said, uh, Karen could tell you we have um, first day of kindergarten, there's not a more diverse group of learners in public school, period. Because no one has the exact same shared experiences yet, educationally, socially, environmentally, whatever. And so day one of kindergarten, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, kids are, are very, very different. Um, even after a week, we're, we're moving more toward shared, you know, shared experiences and knowledge. But we have little ones in our room who came in with great letter knowledge. Um, great you know knowledge of beginning phonics but but almost no fine motor and so what are we going to do with that little guy we're going to capitalize on his uh, on his knowledge of the alphabetic principle letters and some sounds and we're going to go after text because uh, or you know um, within a very supported way um, we're going to be able to get at some hearing and recording some sounds because he has that knowledge pretty hard to get it down pretty hard to do some drawing but boy, he had some skills to build on. And then there are children just the opposite way. They come in as beautiful illustrators with very little understanding of letters and sounds. And so what are we going to capitalize on first? The meaning they're putting into the pictures. Um, so it's kind of that dance. But if you are looking at what the child can do and, and moving from there, it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you. Thank you. Very much. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Any other questions? We've got a second presentation tonight, too, Ms. Wasserman. Okay, so I'll let you lead the way. And I'm going to let Ben introduce his staff. First of all, uh, thank you for uh, having us here tonight. Um, we are uh, here to talk a little bit about uh, the concept of instructional rounds um, and as it applies to uh, the model that we use in our building. Um, before we, we dive into that topic, I uh, want to take some time to introduce our team here. Um, start out with, we can just have you step out here, Ann Gunsel, who is a second grade teacher in our building. Um, with 20 plus years of professional experience. And Christina Wheel, who teaches kindergarten in our building. Um, she has 15 years of professional teaching experience. Sarah Cooper, who teaches first grade in our building with six years of professional teaching experience. And then we have Chelsea Jensen, who's joining us uh, for her first year at uh, Midland Public Schools within our first two years of teaching. Annie Harrison, 
who is joining us uh, for the first year in Midland Public Schools. She also is within her first two years of teaching. And Becky Stern, who teaches first grade, joining us for the first year at Midland Public Schools within her first two years of teaching as well. Um, I point that out because obviously as we move around uh, or move through our topic tonight, we want to be able to basically uh, talk about how each classroom teacher brings a very valuable perspective to the team as a whole. Um, so with that, you'll see that um, our focus basically is a case for improving teacher practice and reflection. Uh, the, the name we basically gave it for our model is walk rounds. Uh, it's, um, it's based on the concept of instructional rounds. Um, but you'll see as we move through the presentation why we, we modified the name a little bit. And our hope is to basically provide an overview, um, kind of a clip notes version, if you will, of, of what our model looks like. Um, it certainly is still a journey for us right now. Um, we're learning a lot as we go. Uh, but to kind of start out with, we basically started with, with some driving questions as we went through this process. Um, the first one, uh, basically the idea, what opportunities do, do professionals have when it comes to feedback and reflection? Um, that's something, obviously, it's a driving question when you think about the topic of improvement. Um, in order to improve at your practice, this feedback, feedback and reflection thing is obviously pretty important. Um, so what we did is we started to look at basically other professions, other activities, um, where we could look at how is feedback and reflection provided in those arenas. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to show a few slides here to kind of capture that concept. Um, if, you, if you think about the concept of a professional ballerina, obviously um, this is a situation where you have typically a one-on-one -on -one coach, almost like a personal trainer, if you will, uh, that is constantly giving uh, direct feedback. It's timely, it's effective um, to help own hone his or her craft um, as a ballerina. The other big thing when you think about um, you know, an activity like this is that think time um, after practice, being able to step away and, and think about the art of what you're doing and how to get better. Take that same concept and you think about a uh, professional musician. Um, in the case of a professional musician, typically you either have a, a director or you have bandmates that are constantly giving you feedback on how you're doing at your craft. Um, basically, that peer coaching element becomes very big when you look at uh, a band of any kind, um, how much teaching happens from your peers as you're working through that practice. And again, plenty of time for, for thinking about how to get better. And then uh, this happens to be a personal favorite, um, <laughs> professional baseball player. Just a baseball player in general, um, you know, I, uh, it's something that obviously there's all kinds of opportunity to, to think about your practice, um, even if you personally are not thinking about how you're doing with the game. You typically have multiple coaches telling you how you're doing. You have your uh, teammates. You know, I can think of uh, times that I have where you, you walk away from the uh, – on deck, sir, or walk away from the uh, batter's box after striking out, and uh, you know you get, well, you've dropped your back shoulder, or you did this, you did that. Uh, you get a lot of feedback, and, and that feedback is obviously very important when you think about getting better. And then the other piece, of course, is is the think time again that's involved with that. So then we move to uh, professional teacher, and this was uh, obviously where we landed when we wanted to start talking about improvement in the classroom. Um, traditionally, classrooms were, were basically their own kingdoms. Um, the teacher would go in, they'd do, the, do their thing, work their craft, work their art, and a lot of times the feedback was coming directly from the students, which is obviously valuable, um, but did it go beyond that? Um, and so that's something that we basically were exposed to a number of trainings where we learned more and more about basically that history, that history of a classroom teacher and what feedback and guidance look like uh, for a classroom teacher. The other big piece with when you think about um, teaching in general, um, every day is basically like a game day. Um, 
every time you step into the classroom, you know, so much is on the line. And obviously, um, you know, we, we, we need to be constantly reflecting on, on that. Um, so with that, we, uh, we basically also start to think about with teaching that think time, um, it's fast paced, it's, it's a high paced environment. And so the time for reflection um, is somewhat limited, but obviously extremely, extremely valuable. So it kind of led us then overall to our purpose, um, purpose of building a, a professional learning team driven to the, the purpose of uh, building deliberate practice in our building. So the individuals that are here tonight are obviously going to share out on their perspectives with that. Um, but the reality is there's multiple people who are not here tonight but are also part of the team. And, and really, um, you know, to the team's credit, uh, that is something that they've really that's a challenge they've really tackled uh, whole scale and, and are committed to that cause. So basically, our uh, first step as we, as we started to think about um, how we were gonna tackle that challenge, we knew that we had to think about exploring what was already out there. Um, you know, has, has there been a group that's come up with basically a, uh, a framework to help create basically a rubric for how do you capture what good teaching looks like, what does it sound like, what does it act like. Um, we all know when we see it that it, you know, it looks right and it's a beautiful thing, but how do we try to capture that and, and critique it? Um, and basically it led us to um, the Marzano Research Lab. Uh, Robert Marzano is a professional dedicated to this cause basically of, of uh, learning about what good teaching looks like and how to not just evaluate it, but, but coach it um, and continue to to learn all the nuances of what student engagement looks like um, in the classroom. And so he has a, a model um, that he refers to as classroom walkthroughs. We'll learn more about that as we, as we move along tonight. Um, but before we started that process of walkthrough, um, we, we kind of came back and we looked at uh, the Marzano Research Lab put out a, a book called The Art and Science of Teaching. Um, and we had kind of a focused staff study, staff development. Uh, the school district as a whole, we were very fortunate, uh, helped kind of sponsor us through that in terms of the, the training for that. Um, but basically what, what the art and science of teaching does is it provides a, a framework for what good instruction looks like by breaking into segments. Um, so basically it gives you digestible bites of how to look at good teaching and, and analyze it. And then the other thing we also looked at was um, the, basically the instructional rounds, which is a practice that um, came out of Harvard. Uh, Dr. Richard Elmore, he came up with this concept. It's very similar to uh, what Marzano has, but the difference is it's um, in terms of the classroom visits, it's very much like a medical round. Um, so if you think of medical rounds, the idea there is um, you know, people that are going into the field have the opportunity to go in and see it in action and, and really dissect what's going on and learn about what's going on. And it's, it's basically on the spot feedback of what's happening um, and sharing some of those ideas. So with that, we kind of built our uh, content knowledge base when it came to how we were going to go about building our own system um, for analyzing basically what we do in the classroom. And uh, basically a journey began. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand things over to Sarah Cooper, who's going to talk about the initial phases of that journey. We're going to first start with uh, who we are as a team and what we kind of look like. So we really started this last year as a school initiative, and we started with three um, players over here, an instructional coach, the principal, and our school psychologist. We had seven classroom teachers on board at this time, one auxiliary teacher, and two special ed teachers. Coming to this year, we look a little different. We're down to two in the further left category with the principal and school psych. Um, the instructional coach is no longer a position it changed, so we didn't lose because of interest, it's lost because <laughs> of change of position. We're up to 11 classroom teachers who are on board one auxiliary teacher still, and one special ed, and that's also due to change in uh, schools. Um, also, we have two classrooms 
not listed in the team but are willing for us to go in. So that's another possibility at a time that we will go into their rooms, but they don't choose to be going in on the rounds themselves. It's really important too as a team that we share some traits that are essential to making the rounds work. Um, the first one is we're collaborators. We have to work together. We have to know that we are trying to get what's best out of going in here. We're gonna work together for the best interest of our students. We're risk takers. We're gonna be willing to try something new and know that it might not work and you might come in and see it, something that totally flopped, but we're willing to put ourselves out there to take that risk. We're reflective, we're willing to take a step back and think, what did I do, what did I just see, what can I pick up from that? We're non-judgmental. We're going in and we're trying to learn something for ourselves. We're not trying to judge what we see in the classrooms. We're trusting, we're willing to trust that our colleagues are gonna come in and observe and take something back from it. We're openness, we're open. We're willing to put ourselves out there, open our doors up to have people come in to see what's going on. And lastly, we work as a team. And you need all this together to make our team work and to get the best out of this kind of reflective practice. The next part I want to talk about is how we came about our current model. Um, it's a hybrid of the walk walkthroughs and the rounds. Um, we put it together. Each one had a little piece of things that we really wanted to incorporate into what we are doing. Um, one of the important things to note is that our principal is not really a part of the rounds. He does not go in, so this is a non-evaluative time. It's a learning time, but um, he definitely helps to facilitate to make it happen. And it wouldn't happen without him being able to say, okay, I can give you some time here, let's shift people here, and let's move this so that you can have time to go in. And that was, I think, the biggest thing is we needed that time. Um, our process. Um, teachers volunteered first off and there was a, a small portion of us at first um, as, as we've seen how much good it does it gets greater and greater um, you volunteer to go into someone's classroom or you volunteer to open your door to others we schedule times to go in it's not an impromptu time it's always scheduled we observe classrooms in action um, we've done lots of different ways to do this we go in at different times we go in with different people we go in with different, a different focus. Um, we always see great things happening in our classrooms, and that was one of the things that we really stress is we always take out what are the positive things that we see in our classrooms that are helping our students. After our, during our time in there, we have some forms to fill out, sort of. We started with a really structured form um, where we were answering questions about what was happening. A lot of people on the, um, team felt it was too confining though and they wanted a more free form where they could just kind of fill in some reflections and what good um, information they're getting from the teacher so we've gone through a couple of changes in form and kind of went from one that we borrowed from the Marzano team to one that we've created ourselves to suit our needs one of the things that we make sure is we always practice in teams and that's two to three people that go into a classroom because after you come out of the classroom, and I'll talk more on this, but you need to debrief. So you need to always have someone you can talk to about what you saw. It's really helpful to say, oh, I saw this. Yeah, I saw this too. And th when they did that, they also added this onto it. Um, the teams are always to include a veteran teacher so that there's somebody there that can guide um, the discussion. Um, and then after we all go, after the team goes in, we come out and debrief for just a few minutes on what we've seen. Um, then we have a, a large debrief where the whole group gets together and we debrief. We try to keep our points to, okay, what did we see that we either want to take back to our classrooms? What did we see that we thought felt was good teaching that we could mimic in our rooms? Um, but always in a positive. Um, at, that, at the large debrief session, the teacher that was observed can choose to go to that session or not. Um, it's actually been very positive and every time that we've had a large debrief the teacher that has been observed has gone to watch it also helps sometimes to clarify a couple of things like what what were you getting at when you saw that because sometimes you'll walk in in the middle of a lesson and not have any idea what was happening prior to that um, and then the last last part I have is um, just the dialogue it's helping us to talk about what we're doing um, to help us be better teachers, help talk about the vocabulary, sharing the vocabulary, sharing the information. Um, 
and it, each time we do it, it feels more comfortable using, using that language, and we're trying to work on a shared language, and that kind of leads right into Anne, who's going to talk to you about our cafe model. teacher-driven and teacher-led. When we have our debrief sessions, we often find topics or ideas that we want to know more about. And so the teacher who has that idea or that topic will create professional development for other staff members. And on uh, PD days, we usually run a carpenter cafe where we have two or three different professional development sessions that we go to. Uh, the sessions run in range from 20 to 30 minutes, and everybody rotates through the sessions. And then often what the benefit is is that many of us take what we saw in those professional development little mini workshops, and we bring it right back into our own classroom and put some of it right into action. Um, which leads us now to our reflections. Um, as Ben said earlier, I have, this is my 25th year of teaching. In my time here in middle public schools, I've seen many educational trends come and go. But what has never changed is what good teaching looks like and feels like. And the instructional rounds is all about good teaching. Um, I myself have become very reflective in my teaching. I have, um, become very purposeful in what I'm doing. I am careful to set up my lessons with a learning target. I am careful that I'm designing my lessons for student engagement. And I am careful when I go into other teachers' classrooms that I am coming away with something that I can use. And some of my experiences that I'll share, um, some of my reflection on what I've gotten out of instructional rounds, um, it's really built a team um, all throughout our building. I, I've never um, felt that we weren't a team, but when I go back into like a fifth grade classroom being from kindergarten, I haven't seen those kiddos for quite a few years. And I think, wow, what a great, you know, what a great change they've made. Look how much they've grown. So it builds that team and we're all part of the same team helping all of our students grow really helps us to feel like we can collaborate. Um, this has led to actually a lot of collaboration. Once we see something in somebody's room, we go back and say, oh wow, you know, let, let, talk to me about what you did there. How can I implement that into my classroom? Um, so the children are benefiting from that because they're getting the strengths of all of us um, through this sharing, through this collaboration and team building. Um, the other thing that it has done for me is it, it's really helped me to feel validated. Sometimes when you're in your own classroom, you feel very alone, um, and you know you don't know, am I doing this right? And you know I need some support here. I need someone to tell me, and you know it, it really helps you feel validated to say somebody, you know, some one of your colleagues is going to come into your classroom, and they're going to help you see what you're doing and how you're doing it, and that you are doing what's best for those kiddos. Um, for me, I, I kind of what Christina was saying, I, I really love the debriefing. It, it just helps us. It's talking about what we see. And it also, it also makes you feel good. This is what I was trying to put out there. This is what you saw. And it, it just, it was a very, it's just the, the conversation you have and the openness and you feel like everyone's listening and, oh, this is a great idea. Why don't you try this? And it just seems like we're such a team and it's a great feeling. And being a younger teacher, I still, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to get all these great things. And I hear so many things, and oh, this is great. Or just even sitting in someone's room, you're like, oh, I like how that is on the board, or I like how this is presented. And you just come back with so many ideas that you just can't wait to use. As a first year teacher, when you join a school and they tell you we are going to be a part of an instructional round and people are going to come into your room as a brand new teacher and observe <laughs> what you're doing, it's a little bit intimidating. Um, but after going, and witnessing Phil War talk about, you know, during our PDs and, you know, meeting these wonderful people, I couldn't feel more comfortable having people come into my room because during our training they said, 
some of the teachers were very honest and said, I got stuck in a rut. You know, I, I feel like I'm productive, but I do the same thing year after year after year. And I know that my colleagues have wonderful strategies that they use in their room, which may be very different than mine, but is that best for my kids? And so to walk into their room and see what they're doing and how they introduce the lesson, it's going to be very powerful for my kids because my kids learn at different strategies. And one of the things that I took from RPD was a self-audit, was with that reflective piece, I need to self-evaluate myself. And it's a part of the coaching that you know we're looking at along with the instructional rounds. And you can look at one instructional strategy or up to three for a full year. And you take that instructional strategy and you grade yourself. Are you a one or are you a four? And four would be mastery. Are you doing it where you don't really have to think about it? It's, you know, comes very naturally. And one of the things with my student engagement and with kindergartners, you know, every five minutes you have to change what you're doing to keep them engaged. And so I might have started off at a two. And from that training and from walking into Christina's room and Chelsea's room, I started trying to integrate two or three of those strategies into each lesson. Well, we might do elbow partners, and then we might move into a choral response. And my students really started to comprehend more of their lesson because we were using multiple strategies along with that. And so as I'm moving up that scale, um, I can take that into my instructional rounds, and as I see Christina doing a strategy so well and it just becomes so fluid, she can become my coach and say, Christina, could you walk into my room and watch how I'm doing this strategy and help me grade myself? How can I improve? Give me some suggestions. So really walking into those different classrooms and seeing those strategies, um, it's very motivational and encouraging um, to try to become that best teacher that I can for my kindergartners. Going off of what Annie said, um, starting out, I was really nervous. I didn't really know what to expect with instructional rounds. It's my first year here at Carpenter, and I've you know, never been a part of an experience like that before, so I wasn't really sure what to get out of the training. Um, but I have to say, after going to the trainings that we've been to and with talking with everyone else, it was an absolutely incredible experience. Um, one thing that we were able to do at this training was we were able to watch some examples of teachers that were being observed. And um, it was really cool because one of the strategies that we decided to keep back as a staff was doing student surveys. Um, and it was really cool to see how we were able to translate those surveys across grade levels. Um, so I have a kindergarten classroom and you know a lot of people would think, how would you do a survey with you know, four, five, and six-year-olds. Well, what we did was I had my um, instructional paraprofessional um, ask the students questions. You know, what is one thing, and then she would um, dictate the responses. What is one thing that you like that Mrs. Jensen does for you? What do you like that helps you learn? And what is one thing that you wish you would do more? Um, and then I got to really reflect on that and see what they liked, things that I could do more, and what the, they really liked that I was doing to help them learn. Um, another really cool aspect that I took from it was I got to interview um, each one of my kids individually, and um, I asked them questions like, what is one thing that you have always wanted to learn about? What is one thing that you want to get better at? Um, and what is something that I can do for you to make that happen? Um, and I got some pretty amazing responses um, from my little ones. I have one student, um, who has always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. And so I met with our music teacher and she's giving him lessons three days a week, our last 15 minutes of the day. And it's just going you know, beyond just you know, the core curriculum stuff, but going into more um, what they're interested in and then tying it back into writing in our writing workshops. Um, I also have another student who um, would like to learn how to dance. She always wanted to be a ballerina, but her mom couldn't afford the classes, so she has a high school mentor that's teaching her dance now, which is amazing. And that's something that she can share um, with the class. And it's also opened the door to, um, you know, we're doing like a spotlight every Friday where um, I take what they got gave me from the interviews, and each every day on Friday for our writing workshop time, we're doing a highlight of what each child chose that they wanted to learn more about. We're doing a mini lesson on it, and that's our writing workshop for that day, and they get to help me teach it. 
And so it's really just that small piece in the training from that, those couple few videos I was able to watch, it was amazing how much I could bring back into my room. Um, and the veteran staff have been so supportive with it. It's a really intimidating thing at first, but they've really made it um, something incredible and that I'm really, really mm. excited for. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy and she's gonna talk about where we're going with that. So I have to agree with Annie. The first time Ben told me you're gonna be on the instructional rounds team and there's gonna be all these veteran teachers coming into my classroom, I kind of looked like them, are you kidding me? <laughs> and uh, Anne saw my face that day and she's like, don't worry, you know, it's gonna be, gonna be great. It's for you to learn, it's a learning experience. We're not here to judge you, we're here to help you. So with that being said, we're moving into our first instructional rounds tomorrow. I'm going into Christina's classroom, she opened the door. I thanked Ben that he didn't make me go first, thank God. <laughs> um, but I, um, it's not about um, them cutting you down, what you're doing better. It's really a learning experience that's for us to adapt things in their classroom. Um, I have kiddos who, um, in first grade, who aren't progressing, you know, and I can take what Christina's doing in her classroom and adapt it for my first grade lessons. What can I do to help this kiddo get where they need to be? Um, it's an awesome opportunity for our collaboration. We're not just digging deep. Um, I'm just not collaborating with Sarah anymore. I get to collaborate with teachers K through five. You know, what are they doing in their classroom? How can I, my kiddo who's above and beyond, what can I do to help them so they're not, so they can achieve higher and higher? What is, what are they doing in second grade that can help me to adapt for my kiddo in first grade? So it's really just gonna be an awesome learning experience for us to see what we can bring back to the classroom, what our veteran teachers have been doing with curriculum to adapt it, how we can bring that back into our classroom to adapt it. Really just a big learning thing, especially for us first year teachers who, are kind of, you know, here's the curriculum, we're gonna teach it, we're gonna do what we can, but then to have that staff tell us, I have a great idea for you, or us to say, wow, we wanna take that back to our classroom, what you're doing is awesome in your classroom, and just have that feedback and that collaboration of what we're doing on a daily basis and not be intimidated when someone walks into our classroom to see what we're doing. It's more of a opening experience and an eye opener to what we can do to grow as teachers throughout our career. So I'll turn it back over. So our journey continues, um, and actually our journey does continue tomorrow with our first set of instructional rounds for the year. What do we hope um, is in our future? Well, we hope that we have more staff members join us, um, at, join our team. We hope to continue to do rounds and to increase the number of rounds that we're able to do. Uh, we expect to have more collaborative time with not just grade level um, staff members, but with also with with staff members uh, in other grades. And because we truly believe that leaders teach and teachers lead, we will be doing some coaching um, with each other on best practices and what good teaching looks like and what good teaching feels like. Thank you, Ann, and uh, thank you to the team. Uh, that concludes what we have uh, to share out tonight. Um, do you have any questions for uh, the group? Yes. Go. <laughs> I have four. That was a very dynamic uh, and overwhelming, I think, amount of information, but a great presentation. I think it's a great program. Um, I have a whole page of notes that I'm <laughs> sorting in my mind because I have a lot of questions. I'll limit them, though. Um, Annie and Christina kind of touched on this a little bit, but th I guess this is just an open question to the group. If anybody feels free, to, uh, please address it. Um, can anybody discuss a piece of specific feedback that, that you may have received through this process that uh, had the biggest impact on how you either, one, deliver instruction in the classroom or how it's shaped the way that this program is evolving? I have a specific thing that happened to me when um, some of my coworkers came into my classroom. And um, afterward, you know, I taught my lesson and it was fine. And um, afterward they said, you have an amazing amount of wait time with your kids. And that's one of the things that many of my coworkers said, we need to know how you do it. What, what do you do, you know, to give those kids that wait time? And I said, oh, that is, that's so nice to hear because, you know, a lot of times in kindergarten, 
you do wait a long time for them to answer the questions. <laughs> and the thing that I, that I told my colleagues was that, you know, I'm not just waiting. If you could see my kiddos' faces, they're figuring out the answer. But you can't see that when you're in the back of my classroom. When you're up front, you can see that they are, you know, they're fi trying to figure out a number. They're counting up to that number. So yes, I do have some great wait time, but I also give my students some strategies. And that sort of brought that to the forefront. I had many um, colleagues come to me and say, I need to use my wait time like you do um, and give those kids time to process what it is that I'm asking of them. That's just one instance of one thing that has come out of this. No, no, that was that was that was fine. Anybody else? Any experiences to share? Okay, I'll move on to my next question. I, 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 right, 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 and, I, and that's why I kind of singled you out initially. Um, the, the, one of the obvious questions to me is that this seems like such a great program, yet there are only eleven teachers on board. Uh, why is there some resistance in the ranks, or or what's going on? We. Uh, we have two, two uh, sections uh, per grade level with exception to um, kindergarten where we have okay. three. So it's, um, you know, we have uh, basically I think about two or three um, that are not participating currently okay. of our classroom teachers. So, and we do, um, we do have some auxiliary staff that participate as well um, and they certainly provide a very valuable perspective. For example, um, our music teacher participates, um, and our uh, her perspective basically is that whole K through five gamut that she sees every day. Um, so it certainly has provided a, a very valuable perspective. But in terms of you know when we kicked this off, basically um, we did a lot of uh, we had a lot of conversations with with schools that had already done this um, and basically tried to learn from them in terms of. You know, do we do we attempt to go whole scale right away? Um, and everything I heard from talking to other schools, not only in Michigan but in other states, um, you know, the idea was basically to to build in areas where where uh, there was volunteerism to to start. So, okay. Yeah. Any in uh, my last question, and then I will uh, pass the floor. Um, what type of academic results have you guys noticed um, so far in your in your program? Um, well, currently we we're kind of at a stage where we haven't had that time to really see. Okay. Um, you know, as we kind of pointed out, with the initial phase was basically that exploration phase, the study phase, um, and so we didn't technically kick off our rounds until I believe it was January of last year. Um, so we've had that second semester of last year, and then with this year, um, with the rounds themselves, we. Uh, really have no choice but to dodge the MEEP window um, in October, so we, sure. as we kick off um, here in November. So um, I guess that's yet to be determined. Okay. See, so. Great. Thank you. Um, so these teachers that don't participate, that's by choice. They they just don't have are not interested in it yet or not ready for that yet. Is that how it works? Yes. Uh, okay. And then how do you schedule? I mean, how do you know who's going where and when? And is it on a regular schedule, or how do you do it? How do you sure. set it up? Sure, um, it's kind of like a massive jigsaw puzzle. Okay. <laughs> no, um, it, it's the the teachers typically give up a, a prep hour um, okay. or a prep half hour um, to to participate, and so. Okay. Um, but with that, we also have, as you heard, the team talk about that crucial debrief time that happens right after the rounds take place. So. Um, for example, if a team of three goes in to see a classroom teacher, um, they try their best basically to at least have a chance to debrief for five minutes about what they saw um, before they move on to the next class to look or before they go back to their own classroom and teach. So uh, the reality is typically our rounds are anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes in terms of the observation, but then that debrief is you know, you say we're going to do a quick five minutes, but it can turn into ten. Um, so it's it's uh, you know it's something that we try to help cover each other in terms of the classrooms. So, how frequently are the observations done? Just while you're on that point. Um, well, what we what we've been doing is basically we pick 
one classroom teacher. Um, and for example, tomorrow, um, the team's going in to see Christina's kindergarten class. And so she'll, through the course of the day, have three different teams that come in. Um, our goal is to build rounds basically um, twice a month is okay. what, what we're looking at. So Excellent. in terms of, um, we use it obviously as the team talked about to share out on ideas and you can see it helps basically build our PD um, as it evolves. Um, so that's another piece from it that, that we've tried to make happen. So. I just want to yeah. say I think it sounds very interesting and really creative, a very creative way to help each other. I think it's, it sounds great. Thank you. Thanks. Several years ago, I was listening to NPR, and I learned about a world-class school that was doing what you're doing here. And I, was, I uh, got on the web and researched a little more, and what you're doing is right along that model, and they had a lot of success from that, and it was neat to hear. Also, I'm interested with the Marzano. This is like the fifth time I've heard Marzano come up in, yeah. in the last two and a half months. So it makes me uh, anxious to get the book and, and read about what um, his practices are, are all about. But in Midland, we're talking about world-class schools and, and wanting to have a world-class school. And I think it's going to require thing, programs like this where we can be reflective and it takes a lot of creativity and work as a team, obviously, um, that you guys are making this happen. So I think it's a really wonderful program, and I'll be anxious to watch and see how it comes out. Thank you. Thanks. Just a comment. I would, I would just like to applaud all of you for stepping out of the box and, and doing this. And you know what's best for you, and it's even better for your, your students. So thank you very much. And hopefully you'll be, be the leaders and we'll see more people in schools maybe taking, um, taking that step as well. So I wish you well as you continue your journey. Thank you. Just a, just a compliment. Um, since I've been on the board about four years or so, um, just with all the changes in the state and in, in teaching, there's just been a record number of retirements. And I just applaud uh, what you guys are doing to try to keep some of the experience going, even though a lot of our teachers and administrators are retired. Um, so I think it's really from a strategic perspective, what you guys are doing with the, with the model and the, and the program that you're doing is really essential. Because I just think about when I came in to my profession, I had those that mentored me and passed that experience on, and I think the kids are to benefit for that. And uh, also, uh, like with the East Lawn folks doing their presentation, it shows that the the models and the creativity from within the district can bring us the best results. And I think about a few weeks back uh, when Chestnut Hill did their presentation also, they looked at how do they get to reward school status. Well, they looked at models, they looked at what was the best fit, but through being creative and being uh, courageous and looking at different models, um, it just shows you that the best things can come from within <coughs> in our own people in the district. It was just really neat to see three schools at the elementary level really get creative and embrace a model and go for it. It's just, it just you guys deserve to be applauded all yeah. yeah. Thank you. <coughs> just a couple of questions. Sure. Um, and this is just a historic bias on my part. I know when I was a young, very young student, you know, second, third grade, when the principal walked in the room, behaviors changed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything changed. Do you feel that same impact when you're doing the rounds when, with the kids, do you see them I'll call it change behavior, change mode. We set it up. Okay. We set it up as some of my friends want to see the great things we're doing. So it, we set it up that way. So if my friends are coming in to see the great things we're doing in our classroom. They might ask you questions. They might not. If they do, please answer. If not, we're doing about our business. Okay. So, so you, that's how I set. You it don't up. get a so bias. So they don't. Yeah. So they don't like. Oh, okay. look at all these people are in here. What are they doing? It's they're coming in to see what great things we're doing. Great. Great. So I haven't had any issues, and it actually helps when, when, when Ben comes in because they're just used to <laughs> people are coming in. They want to see what we're doing. We're just going to do what we're doing. Good. No, yeah, Ben doesn't come around. No, I understand. I just yes. just when, when another <laughs> you know another authority <laughs> figure walks in the room. Yes. You know you, you can see yes. you the can see a palpable change. Yes. The first time it's always a little change. eye opening, and last year I had six people just by how it came out. Those six people walked in, and it kind of at that time was like, oh, that's a lot of people, but they just went back to reading workshop and didn't say anything. Okay. So. Okay, yeah, thank I think you. you just have to set it up that way. Okay. Classroom schools are always open, and we constantly have people coming in and out of our classrooms. 
classroom. Anyway. Ben walks in my classroom all the time, and half the time I don't know he's in there. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so engaged in what I'm doing with the kiddos. So. Um, and actually, on that note, um, with with our current form that we use um, in terms of uh, what we look for when the the team goes in, um, there's actually a, there's a part of that that's student interview questions. So many of our kids are actually getting to the point where not only is there going to be a team that comes in and, and is looking, but occasionally they'll pop next to the student and ask them okay. a quick question. Uh, a lot of times they revolve around learning targets. Um, you know, what is it you learned today, that kind of thing. Because uh, I can tell you that I've been amazed at how spot on, um, even in a kindergarten class, how much a, a child will tell you about um, you know learning targets and um, the lesson in general. So that's another piece we kind of added uh, just recently. So I have four other questions, but everybody else answered. Uh, oh, okay. Them and you answered right. them already. So anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Much. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Thanks for coming out and thanks for what you're doing. Okay, we'll turn this over to finance and uh, Linda. And now we lose everybody in the audience. We have <laughs> gifts totaling $4,700. Uh, Midland Area Community Foundation, and this may sound familiar because I believe we've uh, received some other gifts for the same purpose. This is support for the week of nonviolence activities in this particular case at Dow High School. Uh, also, the Siebert PTO has provided support for Battle of the Books, competition books. Uh, PEO Sisterhood, Chapter CB, has provided some funds to provide uh, um, items for students who may have needs at Northeast. And these could range from small items of clothing to perhaps assistance with lunch, any number of items. Uh, so it's just a, a nice little student emergency fund. And then the H.H. Dow High School Athletic Booster Club. I believe we may have talked or may have received other components of this gift. They have a fairly large plan for making some improvements to the baseball field, uh, anticipating spending about $10,000 total. This is their gift to replace some of the fence. And so at $3,600, it makes up the bulk of the gifts this evening. Uh, but all of them are below 5000 so we were able to receive them, and they are and will be processed. Well, thanks to all the donors, again. It's always so gratifying to see this. That's about basically the end of the agenda. Um, you'll see the correspondence listed in the agenda, and I'll just highlight the fact that uh, we've got our special meetings for strategic planning coming up uh, in a very, just a little over a week. It's, it's com coming up fast, so I look forward to that. And with that, we'll go to study discussion session, and I'll begin to my right with Pam. Have her panic. Um. <laughs> I enjoyed what I saw tonight. I'm excited about um, East Lawn and, as, and what we discussed um, with what's going on at Carpenter. And uh, I'm looking forward to our sessions in December. I think that'll be um, great to have some sessions and uh, do a little planning for our future. Thank you. Sure. Well, I too would like to thank uh, the Eastlawn staff once again and the Carpenter staff. It's, it's very exciting to see what we're doing here in our own community and, and um, for the benefit of not only our students, but our teachers are growing so much. And uh, so I, I wish them well as they continue their endeavors and I look forward to hearing uh, more, more great programs that are, that are going on. I had the privilege to go see Rhapsody Rendezvous the other night, uh, Midland High's talent show, and as always, it was wonderful and, and always full of um, wonderful surprises from the MCs to each of the acts, and I marvel at the talent of, of our, our youngsters in our community. Um, once again, congratulations to our shining stars, Kim and Rob. It's a great program, Mike, and I think I think it means a lot to, to them and, and everyone in the district and our community to recognize people just for doing sometimes those little things that are behind the scene but that are, are so important. And let's see. I think lastly, 
um, Thanksgiving in a couple days, and I think tonight was evident, and, and in many of our meetings, we see all the great things that are going on in the public schools, and I know I am very grateful that my children had the opportunity to attend school here, and I am, I think many of us are very thankful for, for the staff and, and the programs that go on, so I wish everyone well, and uh, to have a wonderful Thanksgiving and a vacation. I really don't have much to add. I just want to say that I always like the presentations. Um, it's just always so exhilarating to see and hear the passion that our teachers have for what they do. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it one more time. I think we're so fortunate to have the teachers we have. They are just amazing. You can say that every time. I That's probably will. <laughs> <laughs> OK, on to me already. Um, also, congratulations to Kim and Rob on the Shining Star Awards. It is really a nice personal touch. In a district that's so big, it's really nice to have that, um, being able to get to know the district. And I can't possibly get around and meet all the teachers and the staff, and it really is nice. And I also share Mrs. Baker's uh, thoughts on that. Um, and, and also, um, I kind of was thinking of a, a Thanksgiving list of things that I'm thankful for as, as a board member. And uh, um, it really is nice to reflect toward the end of the year and go through some of the things. And you know, I'm just thinking of how well the middle school transition went this year. Um, we have a new superintendent, and going through that process, uh, Mr. Wasserman, you helped out uh, a board that has, a lot of us haven't been through that process, and um, that is uh, very great that we got through that process. And uh, and thinking about all the high achieving sports teams and extracurricular activities, uh, we've added the IB uh, to the the uh, primary years, which is really nice, and the foundation support for that, um, and uh, and also. Um, a lot of other board members tonight had mentioned how the uh, um, the the presentations actually add, I think, a lot of life to the board meetings, and it really is nice to be able to um, learn more about MPS and the, the great things that we have, and the um, how some of the strengths from within can really o overcome and um, meet a lot of the challenges that we're having, um, both with uh, uh, the composition of the kids, the challenges, and the changing curriculum, and so forth, and the world class expectations. Um, thankful for the gift from the community, uh, the gifts that we see at every board meeting. Um, also, most recently, with the safety of the buildings and the staff through the recent storms. Um, I know the kids didn't, uh, they weren't too, uh, um, uh, they didn't protest much, uh, being, uh, having a three-day week this week and last week it was really nice. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, um, and, and also with the presentations I also have down here, uh, it's nice to see the creative use of technology. I know we don't have iPads in every classroom and all throughout the buildings, but I was really impressed with what the teachers are doing as far as engaging the students with the technology and, and looking at the strengths and weaknesses and building upon them. Um, and then uh, coming up next week, I'm really thankful for a fresh look at our uh, strategic outlook and, and planning going forward. So it gives Mr. Sharo a chance to be able to uh, uh, open that discussion and see where we're going for the next few years. So I'm looking forward to that next week. Angela. <coughs> All right, well, yes, I very much enjoyed both presentations tonight. I know just from my own experience um, what a great job they do here in the lower elementary school um, with writers. I can't help but think my kids are just so much better writers than I am, and I know that has nothing to do with anything my husband and our, nor I have done to help them along in that. Um, also, the Carpenter presentation was great. I think in my own life, my own job, Everything I do is as a team, and as teachers, I think a lot of times it's more isolating, and this gives them more of that team approach to be able to go in and help each other, and I just know how many times working as a team, and we, we try to stress it with the students even, and it's good for the um, teachers to have something um, structured like that that can help them too. Um, that was great. One thing I meant to bring up at the last board meeting that I didn't, um, as my kids get older, I keep having these ex you know new experiences <laughs> with the district, and. Um, my, my son, through his marketing class, had to go job shadow, and so we you know, picked somewhere for him, and I was just so impressed with how the district has this set up. It wasn't just go find somewhere to do it. It was, you know, here's a form to fill out ahead of time. Here's how you contact the person. Here's what you wear when you go in. Um, here's the thank you note, and you need to write it and give it back to us so we know that you have gone through the whole step. So it was just an all-encompassing, here's a sheet you need to, you know, fill out while you're there. And it was just, I thought, what a great job and what a great, you know, for someone new going into something. They gave them, you know, my son, such a great structure to be, 
able to go in and job shadow and make sure that he got the you know best experience possible out of that. So um, that was great. And you mentioned a little bit um, love our new communication. Also something I brought up um, last time since Dow High had been closed for a day. But after um, the storms we had this last week, I love how we're sending out emails and I got my first text message. And I mean, you can imagine how many people texted me Sunday night wanting to know is school going to be closed? And I had to tell them I don't get that information ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I said, be looking for an email because a lot of them had not experienced the Dow High thing the week before. So I said, you know, be on the lookout for an email. And that worked, I thought, fabulously. And that's it. Okay. Um, a lot of repeating here. Uh, it, you know, John, it was, you said it exactly right. It, it was a great presentation, I, and, and these presentations do add a lot of life um, to our meetings, and I imagine our ratings are going through the roof, and <laughs> we're going to get that 8 o'clock spot uh, <laughs> prime time pretty soon. Get off the um, TV. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, congratulations again to Kim and Rob, our shining stars, uh, our young authors, uh, the presentation tonight, Amy, Trisha, Nicole, Bonnie. Uh, Ben and his staff, I think they have a really innovative program and, and uh, you know, congratulations to them for, for taking the charge and, and having the courage to do that. Um, a, th a thing I think that was kind of overlooked, um, we did go through a massive storm and thank you and I guess congratulations on a job well done to the City of Midland and Mike Sherrill, um, who I'm sure spent countless hours in meetings with consumers and city officials uh, disseminating information to, to us and to the school district. Uh, you really did a great job, so kudos to you for that. Um, as far as things that I could be thankful for, uh, apart from friends and family, uh, we really have a dynamic board, um, so thank you to all of you for, for making it a pleasure to come here every other week and to meet and to, to direct this, this wonderful district and, of course, to our administration. So thank you, everybody, and, and uh, oh, finally, our members who stuck with us tonight. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Uh, and have a hep happy Thanksgiving. Well, on a theme of Thanksgiving, that's where I was going tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank our teachers for their talent, their time, their dedication, and for setting expectations for our students. Um, that's very important, and we didn't lose sight of that. And thank you for that. And thank you to the rest of our staff for setting the expectations of the teachers. And, and uh, and of our students and their and and are setting the right learning environment and giving our people the right tools and opportunities to succeed our teachers to succeed and thanks to our parents for their students uh, but more importantly for their involvement and their expectations and their sense of ownership of our schools and for our community who fund us uh, support us in other ways and again set expectations and you'll notice through all that I mentioned every group setting an expectation of one another. And I think that's what makes Midland Pools schools great, and that's what I am thankful for in this community in terms of education, is that everybody has expectations of one another, and generally they are met, and that's very, very gratifying. And lastly, I'd like to thank Cindy for all the work uh, we've gone through in this last year, and Mike for joining us. Uh, it's a really uh, thankful to have you on board, so thank you very much for joining us. And that, I'll turn it to you. Power outage. <laughs> uh, is the topic right now so uh, I was very impressed with the, our city and how they managed that power outage I mean if you had seen them going to work and Lynn and I went to a meeting and I went, you know I've been in other communities quite a few of them they wouldn't have handled it so well and, and you know I think we give a little credit to consumers too once they got on ground and got crews here uh, we weren't expecting power to be back up uh, and ready to open school back up that quickly and so uh, they surprised us all by beating those timelines and it was a great job by all of them. I want to thank also our staff. We did something different last week and um, I know it was a little bit uncomfortable last week and, and um, everyone was flexible and they made a good day of it um, having brought them in and, and the building principals did a great job of thinking on their feet and ready to go and, and we got some, some real nice production out of that day uh, despite that the power outages so um, it was different and, and probably a little bit uncomfortable. Planning sessions um, next week, it's here already. Um, I want to review real quickly, I think uh, agenda group tomorrow will kind of go over the agenda, but we're going to break it up as we are departmentalized here over here where we have uh, facilities and finance and HR and special ed and technology and instruction and curriculum. We'll review all those areas as well as kind of talk about maybe what, what 21st century learning looks like, if, you can, if we can know how to define that or not. But we'll take a look at all that and maybe come out with at least a general area. I don't know. 
and Jerry and I were talking one day, I don't know if strategic plan was the right terminology we should have used on this, but it's, it's certainly a planning discussion session we're gonna have going forward, so. Um, and, th and then this weekend, um, I had a great opportunity to experience Midland schools real well. We went to the rond rendezvous as well. Oh boy, I mean, Pam and I went in, we had heard that it was a wonderful thing. When we walked out, all we could say is, what talented kids live in this community, what great opportunities they have. And then uh, Saturday we turned around and marched in the uh, Santa Parade and despite all the rough weather that was <laughs> occurring out there and we didn't have the bands there which probably added a whole lot to it. It was very neat to see the community again on an event that turns out and my understanding is they turn out even better when the weather's, weather's a little nicer. So it was, it was a nice event. Um, and, and a reminder that the, we have the renewal of the enhancement millage coming forward. We have uh, um, some guests coming in for lunch one day. We're gonna talk about the enhancement millage as well. And um, last week, the chamber, Women County Chamber endorsed our renewal as well. So I think that's real important that they understand the significance of that being renewed and for our district to be whole going forward. Um, Midland County College Ac Access Network. Um, and so I wrote to you about that a little bit. And I think some credit goes to the Community Foundation for, I think they had that, up, had that up last spring before I arrived. And, I, and some credit for us, um, I think it goes to Jeff Lauer. I went to one of the meetings the other day and he was 75% of what's going on over there. And so um, if you see Jeff, give him a big hand. And they're really gonna make some strides going forward as you saw about getting all of our kids applying to college and potentially increasing the, the uh, college going rate and the finishing rate of kids in, in college as well, which is equally as important. That's all I have. Anything else for the good of the order? If not, we stand adjourned.